Hello everyone and welcome to our last History Bites of 2021. My name is Anna Patterson and I'm a Visitor Experience Assistant here at Guelph Museums. Today we're going to be chatting a little bit about the games and toys of years past. History Bites is an hour-long casual conversation during which we talk about the latest news, exhibitions, and other happenings at Guelph Museums. You can join us on Facebook Live on the Wednesday of every month at noon. A recording of today's History Bites will be available through our Museums Everywhere portal on our website and other social media uh, platforms after the broadcast. Before we begin talking about today's topic, I would like to take a moment and focus our thoughts on awareness and acknowledgement of the land. Guelph is located on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The place we now call Guelph is on land that's described in the Between the Lakes Purchase Number no. 3 Treaty of 1792, an agreement between the Mississaugas of the Credit and the British Crown concerning over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to doing more to learn, share, and support truth and healing. So welcome everybody. For this December History Bites, I wanted to do a topic that was pretty fun and lively. And what better uh, fun and lively thing to talk about than games and toys. And in our collection here at Guelph Museums, we have a ton of games and toys. And we have some really, really interesting ones here. Some that you might recognize from your own childhoods, some that you really don't, and some that continue to exist today. At the end of this conversation about games and toys, you're gonna to get a chance to see some of these staff from Guelph Museums playing a toy or playing a game uh, that is actually in our collection. So stay tuned for that. It was a ton of fun. I think all of our voices are still recovering from that evening of fun. So some of the toys that I have laid out here are some of my personal favorites. Um, and so what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about each type of toy, uh, some of the main ca categories that we have in our collection. And we're gonna take a little bit of a look into what, as to what they are, the history of them, and how we can kind of recognize them today in similar toys or games that we might still have. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the first type of toy that I would like to talk about today are what I sort of refer to as skill-based toys. So these are toys that would help you practice a skill uh, or to uh, learn something new that you would maybe need in later life. Uh, so my personal favorite out of these toys is the oven, and this is an actual working stove. You can see that it does have the cord here, so this would plug in, and then the heating element is actually under the silver grill here. And I think a lot of us can probably relate to this toy um, because I certainly had an easy bake oven growing up um, that I would do all kinds of uh, little cakes and things in and was very excited when they released um, a mix for pizza. Uh, but this is the type of toy that someone would have used to sort of start becoming a little bit more familiar with some um, uh, duties in the kitchen, so things like baking and cooking like that, um, and it was one of those toys that's really meant to mimic um, an adult task, which it would be cooking, um, and I think that this one is just really, really adorable because it certainly comes from the time when this style of appliance would have been the type of appliance in a kitchen, so this is really a teeny version of an actual stove, and I just think it's the cutest thing, and it makes me want to get out my own easy bake oven. Some of the other toys that we have to do with the kitchen are this very small little potato masher. Um, and I think a lot of us can certainly relate as well to the very small kitchen implements that you would find in a little playhouse um, or in a, uh, in a tea set, something like that. And then I also adore, I'm just going to reach here for a moment, this tiny little egg beater. And I just cannot get over how cute it is. So again, it is completely functional. You would be able to actually beat some eggs 
with this egg beater. And so these are really just like today where we have um, play kitchens, play houses, where you would buy um, little toy versions of pots and pans and cooking utensils. Um, they certainly had these within the last 60 years for sure if not earlier. Um, specifically in the, in the 1950s, there was really the rise of kid culture um, in North America, where toys were being designed and sold and mass marketed directly to children. Another toy that I think is really cute um, is this toy telephone here. Um, and again, I think this is one that we can all relate to toy telephones in our childhood. Today, you can get toy telephones that mimic a smartphone, so it's a screen with buttons, will make noises or do what have you. Um, and I remember having um, the, the Fisher-Price pull phone um, as, a, as a child where it was actually a rotary style phone. Um, and so this is essentially the same type of toy where it is a model telephone. And so a child would be able to play with this and pretend that they were making phone calls just like the adults in their family. And you can actually uh, make it ring. So you can really mimic that the phone is ringing and that you'll have to pick it up and answer. Another toy that is a lot of fun is the mini iron. Although I do think that that is a type of toy that you maybe don't see quite as much anymore with small models of. Um, I think ironing is um, a skill that maybe isn't as common as it was 50 years ago um, with the invention of, you know, advancements in sewing, uh, in uh, washing machines rather, um, and in fabrics and stitching, you have uh, wrinkle-free cloth now. Um, and so certainly I don't think ironing is um, as a, a essential a skill as it was considered a while, um, you know, in the last 50 years or so and further, further back. Um, so you don't really see toy irons as much anymore, although I'm sure you could still get your hands on one if you wanted. Now the other toy I'd like to talk about is this microscope set. Now this set is not a toy that would have been used to mimic adult skills in the same way that answering the telephone or cooking would have been essential to everyone. But certainly it would have been a, um, a really treasured toy for someone who was interested in the sciences. And as this became more and more common in the 50s um, and, and on, um, you start to see more of these microscope sets. This one is actually quite early. Um, this one, I believe, is pre-1940. Um, and it has on the back fragile handle with care uh, because all the pieces in it are actually glass. This is essentially a completely functioning working microscope. Um, so it's not the type of toy um, that would be used for very small children. It's not a toy that's meant to, um, to mimic an adult toy, but it is an actual um, functioning uh, microscope. And it actually says right on it for children and grown-ups. Um, so it would work just as equally well for, uh, for anybody. Now, the other two that I have here are sewing machines, and the history of these small sewing machines um, I think is, uh, is really neat because at first glance they might simply look like toy sewing machines um, for children, but uh, sewing machines, once they were invented and um, common in a home, um, you started to actually also have uh, smaller sewing machines being sold too. And that was because they were fairly expensive, they could be quite large, so you might not have a lot of space. And so the first miniature sewing machines that were made were actually meant for grown-ups um, to, to be completely functional, to use exactly the same way as a large sewing machine, um, but it would be smaller to make it, to reduce the cost and so that uh, it didn't take up a ton of space in your home. Um, and then they sort of morphed into an item that would be for children. Um, and so this is something that a child could use to sew. And again, it's not um, meant to mimic the act of, act of sewing, like the phone is meant to mimic a phone call. This is a very functional item. You can use this to sew exactly as you would a regular size sewing machine. 
And I think that is um, very indicative of the skill or of the um, of the importance that was placed on the skill of sewing. Um, it was very important to be able to uh, mend or make your own clothing. Um, and so this was something that uh, would be used by children at a relatively young age. Um, I certainly didn't have a didn't have a toy sewing machine at home when I was growing up, but I did learn how to sew, um, and I remember learning how to sew in uh, in home ec, and I think that maybe I would have taken up sewing a bit more as a hobby if I had a stunningly beautiful little uh, toy sewing machine here that I could practice on. It's a lot less intimidating than the large ones. But these types of toys show what it was like uh, with uh, kid culture starting to really come into focus. Now a lot of these toys are actually from before that time period, which I think is also a good indication of the importance of learning with the toys. Um, and it's really, it goes to show that toys were not just to be played with, they certainly were, but it was also about learning skills that you would need in your adult life. Um, and I think that this collection of toys really does, uh, really does put that into focus. So stay tuned, we're going to do a little swap and with the magic of uh, television, we will, we will have some dolls here in a moment. So as promised, now we'll take a look at some of the dolls in our collection. Now this is only a very small segment of the dolls that we have. We actually have a lot more and you can always explore more on our website. You can explore our whole collection through guelphmuseums.ca. Uh, but these four are some of my personal favorites. Um, and I think help us to really understand the history of dolls. So the first doll that I have here is this one. Um, and she is absolutely stunning. I'm actually not going to pick her up because she is so delicate um, and we need to be extremely careful with her. Uh, she's from around 1835, so she's the oldest doll that we have here on this table. Um, her body is um, made out of porcelain, so her arms, her legs, her torso, her head, are, are, are all porcelain um, and then painted on her um, her features. Her dress is actually real silk. Um, you can tell that because of some of the deterioration that started to happen with the silk. You have here what's called um, silk shattering and that's because of the way that silk used to be treated in the past. Um, it would have lots of um, very small metallic components in the acid washes to make silk. And as um, time goes on and it starts to deteriorate, those tiny little metallic particles start to um, actually cut through the fibers. And so you get this, um, what's called shattering of, on the silk. And you can see it in a few different places. So you can see that this is original silk. It's very old. It's incredibly delicate. Um, and it's hard to imagine dolls being sold like this today that are very much meant to be played with and loved and held, but made out of porcelain and in a real silk dress. So the next doll I'm going to talk about is this one here. Uh, this doll is very special. This is a black infant doll, uh, and this is from actually the turn of the last century. Um, so this is from around 1890 to 1920. We don't have an exact date on it. Um, but this doll was purchased in what is now the Czech Republic and what at the time was known as Bohemia. Um, it uh, certainly is kind of surprising because of the clothes on it. It looks like it's a much more modern doll, but it's actually quite old. Um, and although the head looks like it might be made out of plastic, it's actually made out of composite, um, which was a material that was often used for toys um, around this time period because it was pretty inexpensive to, uh, to create, um, was relatively sturdy, um, uh, but also wasn't going to shatter like something like porcelain wood. Um, now, this doll is part of a really interesting, more slightly more modern tradition of dolls. Um, in the uh, 1700s in Europe and um, certainly in North America, the majority of dolls that you would see for sale um, were white dolls. It wasn't until um, the 1850s um, and 60s, right after the American Civil War, that you started to actually see dolls that were created by toy companies and sold that were black. 
So this doll is part of that tradition. Then around the turn of the century, you start to see more dolls being made in a wider variety of races. Um, and this is from that time period, from that turn of the century, early 1900s period. Um, and so this is part of that movement towards having dolls that represented more people who would actually be playing with the dolls. Um, certainly dolls would have existed m much earlier than that, um, but typically they would have been handmade. Um, they wouldn't have necessarily been mass produced uh, for, pe for a wider variety of people to buy. Um, so I think that that's really interesting and certainly the clothes I think is fascinating because they do look just so modern. Um, and yet this doll is, um, is actually the second oldest doll that I have on the table right now. The next doll that I have here uh, is Raggedy Ann. Um, and this one has a special place in my heart because I had a Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy doll um, when I was a child. And I think they're probably still somewhere in my parents' basement. Um, so this was a doll that was created based off of a storybook um, in the early 1900s, in 1915. Um, and it was published and it was the adventures of this doll. And then the doll was created to go with the story. Um, and then later on, um, uh, Raggedy Andy came out and other characters as well. Um, but Raggedy Ann was a very common and very popular doll. Um, and I think especially around this time period in the 1900s, and this doll specifically was made um, around 1937, this is really at um, the height of the Great Depression. So this is a time period when there isn't a lot of disposable income, there isn't a lot of money to spend on toys at toy stores, it's more likely that you would um, that you would uh, make your own toys. Um, this one was purchased likely from a toy store. It most likely wasn't handmade, although the clothes actually were, um, the original clothes were lost and the, um, the replicas were made in the 70s. Um, but this type of toy is a lot more durable, so it's not something that would break and have to be replaced all the time. This is a toy um, that's really meant to be um, long-lasting and sustainable, and so I think that's really indicative of that time period, um, that you just, there wasn't money for most people to be able to afford dolls made out of porcelain or even composite. Now the last doll that I have here is quite a bit smaller, and it probably wasn't a doll that was specifically for um, uh, for playing with for children. Um, it is a doll that is dressed in the uniform of the Guelph Nursing School, um, and so you have the uh, the cape with the uh, with the uh, blue on the outside and the red on the inside. You have the fabric for the for the Guelph nursing uniform um, made out of the dress and she also has a little cap on the back of her head and so this doll was clearly meant to um, represent what was being worn by the Guelph nursing school uh, nurses um, which I think is is very very sweet um, and uh, is a really nice tie in to the history of the nursing school here in Guelph. Now, of course, along with dolls, you have all of the doll accessories. So the other items that I have here on the table are actually for dolls. They're not for tiny babies to use, for instance. Um, the red sled, especially, this is such an iconic toy um, to have, uh, but this one is specifically made for a doll. You can tell that a human child would not be able to fit in this, so this is something that um, would have been purchased for a child to play with with their doll. Similarly, the carriage here would have also been a doll carriage. It would have been um, made to look like baby carriages that people were using at the time, um, but as you can tell again from the size, very much meant to be for a uh, for a toy. Um, and again, this one likely would have been relatively expensive um, because you have the different materials materials here um, that would have um, been fairly expensive to purchase, like leather. This is actually made out of leather. Um, the other items that I have here are some of my absolute favorites because they are so cute. Uh, they are uh, doll furniture. 
Now this, all of these pieces of doll's furniture, the cabinet, the piano, the, oop, the telephone, um, and the, um, and the tea set, they were all actually part, originally part of the same doll house. Um, and this doll house was owned um, and used by uh, cousins um, who were living in Toronto in 1905. We actually have a very extensive amount of furniture from that dollhouse, um, and I chose my personal favorites. Um, I think that the the detail in the tea set is just exquisite. You can tell that as much care was put into that as a regular tea set at the time. You have the cabinet that does in fact actually open, so you can of course store all of your tea uh, your tea sets in here. The piano lid opens so your dolls can practice, but possibly our favorite is the little dollhouse telephone that actually has the little uh, receiver that will move. It's attached with a tiny little piece of string so you could actually use it and have your dolls make phone calls, which is just incredibly precious. The history of dollhouses is also really interesting um, because again, like a lot of toys actually, they started out as something that was meant for adults. Um, the very first dollhouses um, in Europe were out of cabinets and they were really meant to mimic a fully decorated room um, and they were points of pride. It was something you showed off to your friends and people would come to look at and they could be incredibly expensive. A small or a dollhouse that was dressed up uh, with all the furnishings could actually sometimes cost as much as a regular house at that time period. Slowly um, it sort of evolved into something that could also be played with uh, by children. And so it became, it moved to more of a, um, of a traditional child's toy. Um, that being said, it is still a very common hobby um, to collect and to build uh, dollhouses for adults. So it's something that can be enjoyed by uh, people of all ages. Um, and I certainly remember growing up playing with my dollhouses. My absolute favorite dollhouse that I ever had uh, was a Victorian Playmobil dollhouse. Um, I still think about that dollhouse all the time. It was a ton of fun. So this again is a type of toy that we can all uh, relate to pretty well with having dolls, doll accessories, doll furniture, doll clothes um, around our homes. Um, and some of these you might have uh, in your own home, especially the Raggedy Ann doll. I know I still have mine. So now we are going to again, through the magic of television, uh, clear the dolls away, and then we'll have a new set of toys to talk about. So I've pulled out a few more toys from our collection here as well. Um, and these ones I think are really fun because they're such a good example of the types of things that would have been commonly played with. So first of all, I would like to talk about um, the stuffed animals here. So we have here, this one um, is a little bit hard to see because it has been clearly very well loved, um, but this is a stuffed cat. And so the fabric is actually printed with the cat design and then inside is stuffed, um, likely with a material like sawdust. Um, and same with here with the pug dog that we have. This one's a little bit lighter, so it's probably filled with something like cotton. Um, but again, the cover is actually printed with the pattern of a dog on it and then sewn together. This one I absolutely adore. I think it is just one of the most precious things. Um, this has clearly, um, again, been so well loved. Um, it's been hand sewn and it's stuffed with rags, which is a really good indication of the type of toy that would be available to honestly the majority of people at this time uh, because it was something that you could make yourself. Toys that you could purchase um, in a toy store in the 1800s were generally a lot more expensive, but the average person would be able to make their own toys. Um, and for instance, this one stuffed with rags would be sort of leftover material around the house uh, from other types of activities. Um, and I, I just think that you can, you can get such a good sense of, um, of really the affection that, uh, that this toy would have had um, in its life. 
some of these other toys um, are also uh, very sort of iconic toys. Train sets have, of course, um, been a very popular toy for a very long time. Um, and this one here is a lot of fun because it actually has a functioning crane as part of it. Um, and you can sort of uh, move this around, use the crane, and you can imagine how much fun this would have been on a full model train set. This toy here is um, a little bit harder to identify um, unless you actually read the front there and see that it says bank. Uh, this is a bank still, or as we would maybe call it today, a piggy bank. Um, so this is actually a pair of, uh, of uh, banks like this. We have another one in the collection that is essentially identical but doesn't have um, the same amount of paint left on it. Um, and this, these were owned by a pair of sisters. Uh, here in Guelph, and so it's quite heavy, um, but you can see right on the back here is where you would put the money in, and then the screw on the top can be undone, and then the, uh, the lid lifted off to access the money. So this is not the, uh, um, the tragic breaking of the piggy, ta piggy bank that you sometimes see in media. Uh, this box here has some very interesting blocks in it. Again, building blocks are the type of toy that as a, um, as almost a genre of toy have been around for an incredibly long time um, and uh, sort of shows up in different ways. Things like Lego, Lincoln Logs, those are all kind of the same concept of toy that you're building something. And so this is in that vein of toys. These are from uh, this we don't know for sure, but it's likely from um, the 1930s in Germany. And the thing that I like about these is that they come with very specific pieces. So they have windows, columns, they have the, uh, the top of the, of the building, and then on the lid, it actually gives you some different examples of the types of things you can build with this. Um, and these sets, this is a, um, is a smaller one, but you can find uh, sets with a lot more pieces online. Now of these toys that are on my table at the moment, my favorite is probably actually this one right here. Um, it is quite heavy. This is made out of cast iron. Uh, so this is, not a, uh, this is not the quality of a dinky car. This is gonna hold up. Um, and the reason that I like it so much, aside from the fact that it's so heavy duty, is that it is a, um, a toy that we have versions of this today. You have model, model cars um, where you would have construction equipment or an ambulance or a fire truck um, that you would have to play with. Uh, but this one represents a type of vehicle that we really don't use anymore, which is an ice wagon. Um, so of course, before the invention of uh, freezers and refrigerators, it was a lot harder to keep things cold. And so you would certainly have an ice wagon here that would deliver fresh ice to your home to refill your, um, your freezer. And so, and of course drawn by, uh, by a horse and it's a wagon. Um, so not even a, a car that would be driving it around. And so I think it's really a fun way to think about the fact that some things have changed a lot in that in what we actually represent as toys. So rather than it be um, a helicopter or an ambulance, something like that, it's something that would have been completely identifiable to the kids at the time. So the concept itself hasn't changed, but what it is has. And I think that that's really fun um, to get a little bit of perspective on the past and always keep in mind that the kids playing with these toys in the past really weren't that different uh, from kids today. Now what we're going to do, we've taken a look at a bunch of toys and again we have so many other toys in our collection. So if you have a toy uh, that you have at home and you're wondering if we might have an example of it in our collection, you can always check online by searching our collection at guelphmuseums.ca. What we're going to do now is that we've taken a look at these toys. I'm going to again clear them away and we're going to bring out some of the games. We now arrive at the game portion of today's History Bites. So looking through our collection of the games that we have, we have quite a wide variety. We have really recognizable games um, like a hearts card game uh, and domino pieces. And then we have some that are a little bit different. Um, I think this set of pickup sticks is really beautiful. 
Um, they are very, very old, very delicate, so I'm not going to pick them up, but they're in different shapes. So when you would drop them all on the, on the ground or the table, whatever surface you were using, it would actually add a, an added level of difficulty because they weren't all smooth sticks. Some of them were shaped in different ways. We also have the game Wheeler Dealer, um, and this is, uh, today we might call it something like Guelphopoly. Um, so it's based off of a Monopoly game board, but with places uh, and businesses from the city of Guelph. For instance, uh, one of the green spots here is Stone Road Mall, um, and that's worth, worth uh, $36,000 according to the, uh, to, the game, to the game board. Uh, we also have uh, this one here, which is a uh, keyword. It's a crossword game. Um, it's actually a little bit similar to, um, to Scrabble, but it has a different sort of objective and some different rules here. Um, this one is very, very tiny. We actually don't have the whole game. We actually just have what would be the lid of the game. And this is from, um, from 1828. So this is very, very old. We do also have a couple other games that we'll, uh, we'll do some clips of. We have a Canadian trivia game um, that dates from 1897. Uh, so a little bit later, I will test some of my coworkers on Canadian trivia as it was understood just 30 years after Confederation. Now keep in mind that this is from 1897. Uh, what large fur company operated in Canada during the present century? Hudson's Bay? Yeah! Right. Good job! Hudson's Bay Company! Uh, we'll do one more. One, one last one. This is a tough one. Uh, the when... others weren't? <laughs> <laughs> They're all a little tough. When did Prince Edward Island joined Confederation. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1873. Okay. There we go. So we've brushed up on our uh, Canadian history trivia for today. Yeah. Wonderful. Really, I, I need to study a little more. <laughs> it's okay. Well, we've got the game now, so we can practice. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Kylie. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Okay, ready. So Heather, these are trivia questions from an 1897 Canadian history trivia game. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? No. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> when was the CPR completed? The CPR, the Canadian Pacific Railway. Correct. But what year was it completed? 1857. You know what? It's not a bad guess. Yep. 1886. Oh. Uh, who was the leader of the last Northwest Rebellion? Louis Riel. Louis, I was, oh, you I almost had, yeah, yeah. Right? I was going to say Louis Riel. Yeah, oh, I should have waited. Yeah. I should have waited. I get half a point. You get half a point for that one, Thanks. yeah. Yeah. So how are you feeling with your Canadian history trivia today? Well, I gotta earn my master's one way or another. There we go. Okay. Well, this is today's make it make it or break it. Who was the leader of the rebellion in Upper Canada William in 1837? Well done. Well done. When was the old Welland Canal opened? Uh, 1828. Oh my gosh, you're so close. 1829. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. That's the topic of my master's research. Is, is it? His canals and so on. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. All right, Serena. So you have been uh, my fearless camera person all day, but now you're in the hot seat uh, with Canadian trivia. Are you ready? Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> when did British Columbia join Confederation? Um, 1873? Oh, very close. 1871. The what was the battle in which General Brock was killed? Queenston Heights. Correct. Ah. Well done. <laughs> Excellent job. Thank you for playing. Are you, are you feeling confident? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for participating anyway. Of course. Um, by what name are the people known who remained loyal to the British Crown during the American War of Independence and afterwards came to Canada? Uh, <laughs> no idea. That was the Loyalists, the United the Empire Loyalists. Loyalists. 
Isn't there a school name for that? Oh, probably. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I've That's heard okay. the word. <laughs> <laughs> what large fur company operated in Canada during the present century? Is it the Hudson's Bay? Yeah, it is. Yes. Well oh, done. Yay. I've got to say, while I was doing research for this exhibit, or for this History Bites, my favorite thing that I came across was this game right here called Pit. Uh, and right on the on the box, it says the world's liveliest party game. Now, I looked a little bit into this game, and while I was trying to do some historical research on the game, I was bombarded with ways to buy it today, and not a vintage copy from collectors, but the actual game of Pit. I had no idea that this was still a game that was popular and had been played by some of my friends and coworkers. Um, this game was invented and first sold, invented in 1903 and first sold in 1904 by Parker Brothers. Um, this copy that we have here is from about 1947. Um, and then we purchased a copy um, at the local, uh, local toy store just right now in 2021. Um, and I thought that it would be really fun to test it out, to really see if the claim, the world's liveliest party game, uh, lives up to what it's claiming to be. Um, so uh, I took it uh, upon myself to sort of uh, voluntell my friends and coworkers that we would be playing this game. Uh, so one snowy evening uh, here at the Guelph Civ Museum, we stayed late after work um, and uh, we played the game of Pit. Um, and it was an absolute blast. So you're gonna see some clips of us playing the game of Pit. Now, what I think is particularly interesting is keep in mind when we're playing it and when you're watching us that this was popular in 1904. So you can imagine what people were wearing and dressing like and the, the social norms of 1904. Uh, so imagine that type of person from just after the Victorian era, Edwardian people playing this game um, and probably shouting just as loudly as we were. Um, so I hope you enjoy the Guelph Civic Museum staff playing Pit. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a visitor experience assistant here at Guelph Museums. And as the only person at this table who has played this game before, I am going to crush it. My name is Anna. I'm a visitor experience assistant here at Guelph Museums. And you know, I've never played this game before, but I really think given all of my dedication uh, to card games that I am going to, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. Um, I'm Bronwyn McAvoy and I am a janitor at the museum and I think I have the loudest voice in the room and I think I'll, I'll get it that way. Three, two, one. <laughs> two cards involved. There is an advanced version. Oh my scared gosh. Of, so we're just oh, Okay, Kylie, as the former winner, I feel like you should yeah, be the one start. to like okay. bring us in. Let's just start.
the community relations coordinator here at Guelph Museums. And I think I'm gonna win because I didn't come here to make friends. And Kylie, she's winning, but I see her game and she, she's showing weakness. You can tell in her eyes. I'm gonna take her down. I'm Frankie. I'm the facilities assistant here at Guelph Museums and I've never played this game before, but I'm gonna do the thing and win the points. Hi, I'm Kylie. I'm the education assistant here at Guelph Museums. Um, and you know, I'm winning right now. Julia talks a big game, but we all know who's coming out on top tonight, okay? It's, it's me, I'm winning, I'm going to win. Hi, I'm Serena, I'm the digital engagement assistant here at Guelph Museums, and I was told if I don't win tonight, I'll lose my job. Uh, so <laughs> you can find me on ZipRecruiter. I don't want to be an oil baron anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I keep getting oil? Okay. Oh, this one's down to you to... Oh my god! Three! 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 Three!
The adrenaline. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm exhausted. I know. <laughs> My throat's gonna hurt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Serena. Round of applause. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for playing with me. That was so much fun. So 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 Thanks for organizing. Oh, my pleasure. This was a blast. It was. Well, I guess I can delete my ZipRecruiter account.